The CU Insight Experience is brought to you by Elan Credit Card. Elan partners with more than 250 credit unions to provide an outsourced credit card program. Welcome to episode 148 of the show. I'm Randy Smith, one of the co-founders of CUinsight.com, and I'm excited you're all here today. This show is all about taking a deep dive with the leaders of the credit union movement who make it so great today. I am having another conversation with Jill Nowacki. Jill is the founder, president, and CEO of Humanity. She also happens to be my human and my favorite guest on the show and a frequent guest. So welcome back to the show, my love. Thank you. Well, let's let's just jump right in. It's been about a month since we got back from Africa. We were in Kenya and Tanzania, where we were part of the Climb Africa team that raised money and awareness for the new Akaska Academy. And as part of that experience, we, we spent six days on Kilimanjaro with 17 other credit union leaders from around the world. Uh, Caroline Willard was just on the, the show the last episode. We talked a little bit about it, but I really wanted to circle back with you. Now that we've had a little time to unpack that experience, we, we were fortunate enough to summit Kilimanjaro, 19,341 feet with Caroline, as I mentioned, Greg, David Mategua, Katie Zaleski, and of course, master hiker Gary Singleton. So if you could, could you share a little bit about that experience and, and also... You know, there there were more than just Kilimanjaro when we were over in Kenya and Tanzania. We had a, a, a amazing workshop with folks from all over the continent and the world there as well. So uh, I'll just let me stop talking. Tell us about your experience, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it was an incredible experience. And it's one of those things that I think we spent so much time preparing for it, both physical training, fundraising. I was so fortunate to be able to outsource all of my packing to you. Um, <laughs> but Speaking of the fundraising, it's still going on. So we'll link to the, the Climb Africa links in the show notes. People can still uh, support the new Acosca Academy. Excellent. Thank you. So with all that prep work and the many months that went into it, I think we were officially committed at CUNA's GAC last year. So February or so. So a good solid, what, eight months of us really being centered around this, this upcoming activity. And then it happened. And as we were in it, it flew by. And, you know, I, I maybe that summit day, the, the 3 a.m. to 2 p.m. hike there on that day, maybe didn't feel like it flew by, but the experience as a whole just went by so fast and then it was over. And I think, you know, it's been one month to the day since we got down from the mountain no. as we're recording this, but we went straight from the mountain into that that workshop that we did and then straight from the workshop onto the Serengeti and had that opportunity as well while we were there to see the magnificence of the Serengeti, but also the damage that's being done by the severe drought that's that's in Africa right now and how that's hurting the animals and, and the people and the economy. And so, yeah, there has been definitely a lot to unpack. And I think kind of just to, to summarize it, because I can't possibly get through all of it, but <laughs> um, the, the takeaway from the experience is how just interconnected we all are, how the things that we do for better or for worse impact others throughout the world and how important it is to be more intentional and cognizant about the things we do because of that impact it has on others. Absolutely. I was just thinking yesterday in the Climb Africa WhatsApp group, people were talking about the effects of global warming and, you know, I mean, how it's not only affecting the animals on the Serengeti and other places, but like you said, the whether it's farming or anything else. So, yeah, it, it's we are all connected. That is for sure. Was there an experience or something that you've taken away that when you think back on it, you were amazed about that moment. You know, the, one of the things that, I mean, with six days, I'm, I'm kind of going back to the Kilimanjaro trek and the climb. We spent a lot of time together and, and a lot of time. And I, you know, something I was surprised by is like everything we'd read or I'd read beforehand was like, make sure you bring AirPods or headphones, right? So you can listen to audiobooks because you're just, it's a lot of hours. I'm not sure anybody ever put in their headphones, right? Like everybody was talking and different things going on. So was there anything, that, I guess, when you're looking back now, as you said, a, a month to the day since we summited, that really still sticks with you, that conversation that you had on the mountain or anything like that? Yeah. So I, um, you know, sort of 
appointed myself as the social director in my own mind <laughs> on that. And uh, it's the something mayor like, of the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> I picked this little thing up a few years ago when I did an extended hike in Switzerland with friends of mine. And uh, even when it's close friends, you know, really well, there's, you know, after four or five days, kind of like you're done updating each other on your families and stuff. And the, the conversation goes a little different. And so I had these little like question kind of conversation starters we use then. And I, I took that into the conversations and Africa with more, you know, strangers in many ways with that. And one of the questions I asked... <laughs> strangers when we started. And, right. Afterwards, right. Sure. <laughs> and not all, right? And who you going into it? Um, so, <laughs> but, you know, was asking questions. And one of the first questions I asked was, who's your favorite heroine? And so the, the folks around me at the hike at that point, each person answered and it was interesting. And Maureen from Akaska said, well, are we going to get a chance to answer about our favorite hero too? So it was really clear to me she had someone in mind, a, a male figure who she really admired and looked up to. And so the, the next day or two days later in the hiking order again, close to Maureen again. So I invited her to share her thoughts on that. And she talked about George Ambato, who, of course, previous podcast guest, I'll throw the shout out in for you, but is the the CEO of Akaska. So for those listening, the Trade Association for all of Africa's credit unions and Maureen works with George there at the association. And, you know, it's always amazing to me as somebody who works in the human side of credit unions. It's always amazing to me when people love their leaders, when they admire their leaders, when they're in a workplace where they feel like they can they can be themselves and they connect with people. But what Maureen went on to talk about was George's true and deep commitment to in this advancing women in Africa's credit unions. And the the way he has affected change, made change possible, stepped through change. And it's, it's tricky. You know, he, at one point in the conversation, he and I were talking and he, he said to me essentially, you know, Jill, I know things aren't perfect for women in the United States, but it's, it's different in Africa. The issues are different. The challenges are different. And, and certainly they are. And we recognize that even here in the United States, when we're trying to make change, um, we may not see it as being radical change. Like in 1974, when we started lending money to women without male co-signers, that was radical change. But it's not that way anymore in the United States. Some of what he's doing is very radical in, in Africa, what he's suggesting. And he's he's stepping through it in such a way that it doesn't, maybe it doesn't always feel so radical. It helps to bring others along and bring people forward so that impactful change can happen. And to hear from somebody who's on his team, who's seeing that, witnessing it, benefiting from it as a as a younger woman who's a professional there too. Yeah. yeah. And so that to me is something that in all the conversations we had over the six days, it's something that's really stood out to me because first of all, that's so heartwarming to hear somebody <laughs> in that experience and enjoying her professional career. But second, it's just such a testimony to the work that can be done and that George is helping to do in Africa too. W was there a story and you may have to clear this up or you might be like, no, that's not how the story goes. Where, <laughs> um, and I don't know if it was from George or if it was from David Mategua, the chairman of the Kenyan police SACO, where they realized as the third largest SACO or credit union in Kenya that was there something about like women weren't allowed to have counts, accounts or something like that, even though they were police officers or the spouse of or widow of a officer who was killed in the line of duty couldn't have an, so something that they changed you know i mean that big change that to me that seems like a pretty big change right like yeah if if i understand correctly and having heard the story but it was several years back at the planning session for the credit union they identified they uncovered an issue where their bylaws were creating unintended consequences so the bylaws at the time, you know, several years ago, uh, the bylaws didn't allow women to be primary members. And, and yes, yeah, so that what happened was they had no intention of cutting people off from their accounts or their money, right? But what happened was that an officer had been killed. And because of the way the bylaws were written, his, his wife, his widow didn't sort of automatically have access to membership and, and to that. And so it was something that, you know, oh, well, that's not what we meant to happen with right. that. Like, yeah, this is right. not why they were written. Like, nobody, nobody had an intent to take advantage of the members or exclude people from it. But it is one of those things where at the time, perhaps the way the bylaws was written, nobody 
question that it wasn't out of line to have been written that way. But then as it played out, that was not what they intended. And so they had the opportunity and and they did make the decision to fix that. And in fact, today, that credit union has not only do they serve women, but they have female board members yep, too. Female board member was at my table actually during the the workshop. So from from that credit union, let me ask you. I guess this is the one other question that I really wanted to make sure, and I think it ties into the work that you're doing with humanity here in the states as well, because you've been busy. I was intrigued. I, while we're all walking together, you kind of could hear the conversations that were going on, and you know something that kind of stuck out to me is when you. People were talking to you. A lot of people were picking your brains about diversity, equity, inclusion, whether it was on the hike or in the you know workshops or having a glass of wine afterwards um, once we were back on flatter land. And I was surprised how many people, when they first started talking to you about DEI, they didn't understand or I don't want to say that they didn't understand, but they were almost like, well, every time I hear somebody talk about DEI, it seems to be about a very specific like group of people and not that equity and inclusion overall, the broader sense. And could you talk on that a little bit? Because it's so many, I guess when I was sitting there and overhearing these conversations, right? Like, I'm like, wow, these are system leaders who are actively involved. And like, they're still feeling almost like the DEI conversation gets pigeonholed at time. And they all seemed so lit up, basically, to use a word that you like to use. When they would hear you talk about inclusion overall or equity overall thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big tap. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if I'm understanding your question, right, and let's just dialogue on it. So if I start to go down the wrong path here, uh, reframe me or reposition me here. But I, I think what has happened. So when I started humanity in 2019, at the time, there was a lot of conversation in the credit union space about like, is this of strategic importance? Like, sure, we learned a lot after the Me Too movement in 2017. And we recognized that we should do more for pay equity or gender diversity or kind of whatever. But there was still a really big learning curve in 2019 where it wasn't clear what the value of strategic integration was. When George Floyd was murdered in 2020, it increase the social awareness as not just from people, but from businesses and corporations across the United States, outside of credit unions too. And additional emphasis and focus on Black Lives Matter and a lot of concern about racial equity and and well-being definitely escalated the visibility of that. I think that we've also seen other issues over time that have been what I would say is maybe issues based DEI. So we, you know, it's June and we're going to focus on the LGBTQ community. It's March and we're going to focus on women, but almost this sort of whack-a-mole approach to it where the issue that pops up in the day is the one that we attend to and not this broader look at equity and inclusion. And so what often happens in, in the U.S., a lot of our focus is on racial equity. And if we are looking in the U.S., at DEI as being an issue of black and white, then we look at Africa and we say, well, racism must not be an issue there. Because like particularly South Africa is different, unique. I don't have experience in that area, but Kenya, Tanzania. But what you look at when you're there is they have issues of equity and inclusion as well. And those issues stem from they have gender based issues, they have colorism, tribal, certainly socioeconomic classism through it. And what we recognize to be true is, unfortunately, and, and the book cast does an excellent job looking into this. But anytime we have a society where we can identify or mark a difference in that, we can create constructs that exclude. And you can step back from that and say, oh, well, it's it's arbitrary to say someone should be included based on color or not. It's arbitrary to say someone should be included based on sexual orientation. But the reality is that in these systems, we do that. And systems include our countries, they include our organizations, our companies where we work at. And so I think what we ended up talking a lot about was not, you know, how do you address racism, bigotry, homophobia, gender discrimination? But how do you create this more inclusive system that can help every individual 
be able to to be operating in their best where their strengths are valued, their strengths are seen. And when you focus on it that way, it really becomes something that can be applied across different systems. So if your organization is an organization that has a history of discrimination against immigrants, the same practices that are going to help an organization that has a history of discrimination against women are important. There's more education, capacity building and learning, but that general ability to commit to say we're creating an inclusive environment, we're looking at our systems and structures for equity, those those are applicable. And so that's a place where I think what really kept on coming up was how do we learn from one another? How can I, if my organization is facing a different challenge, if my country is facing a different challenge, how do we still learn from what others have experienced and done? Did that address what you were getting at? Absolutely. But I'd like to take it a little bit of a step further because when you were talking, I, I remember like so many of the conversations that you were having, you could almost see a light going on in people. And a lot of these folks do strategic planning, whether it's with credit unions or SOCOs or whatever it happens to be, right? We're you would mention the strategic benefit of this. Can you touch on the strategic benefit of DEI? Because like I said, these are a bunch of folks who are, are advocates in the industry. And to see that light connecting dots, right? Sure. If I was better at remembering numbers, I could give you really specific facts and data <laughs> from um, from groups like McKenzie or Arizona just did a study that really focused on industries more in the financial services industry and came out with that. But, it, you know, I'll, I'll just leave it at the business case for DEI is strong. It's continuously proven that organizations with greater diversity do a better job connecting with their target audience, selling products to their target audience and resonating with. So income is higher at companies with more diversity. Financial performance is better. And I think what we end up seeing, though, if you look at strategic objectives of credit unions, so just top of head, a few that come up, we we want to increase ROA, we want to grow our membership, we want to increase our ad sets, we want to increase our products per member. Well, all of those things can be more effectively achieved when we are creating systems and structures and products that bring more people in, that resonate and connect with more people. So from that that strategic side of it, that business side of it, being able to actually look at something and say, how is the way we've designed this access point or this product going to impact other folks? And so... One of the things that early in my career, back when I was working at MAPS, um, you know, we had gone through the journey to become a CDFI certified credit union. It means you make a statement of commitment to the low income underserved in your community. And a big part of the product we were looking at doing was, um, at, you know, access to affordable transportation. So what we recognized was a big part of the consumers we were trying to target at that point did not have affordable transportation. And I was talking to a, a member of the community who I sought out a lot as a sounding board and to get advice. Um, and he said to me, all right, if you know you're trying to target people who are relying on public transportation to access your branches, have you ever considered where you put the address on your business cards to include the bus stop that's closest to that? And it's like, well, no, I hadn't because <laughs> the group of us who are having these conversations and making these strategic decisions all own reliable transportation. And so if you ask me, how long does it take to get to a branch? I'm like, well, it's about three miles. So I don't know if there's traffic, maybe nine minutes. But if you ask somebody who has to take and in Salem, Oregon, we don't have a metro. So if you ask somebody who's relying on public transportation what it takes, they'll talk to you about walking to the bus stop, changing the bus, waiting for the bus, when the bus breaks down, the bus delays. And something that takes me nine minutes might take them three hours. And that's something that people should be cognizant of. So if I'm wanting to raise awareness and provide loans for affordable transportation to people and they have to come into the branch in order to get what they need, Am I creating an obstacle to really reaching those people that makes that buy here, pay here car dealership a lot more attractive because that's one stop and one time? And so, you know, it's a very specific example, but I think that, that the, the point of it is really dig in to these products, these services, these access points, and don't just say, okay, I'm going to put myself in the shoes of a consumer and what would I do? Because I'm coming at it from a place of privilege. I'm coming at it from a place of 
you know, access, understanding, integration with the traditional financial services from my whole lifelong income, all of these things that the person I'm really trying to design for is not coming from that same place. If, if my desire is to provide affordable transportation to somebody who's been historically unbanked, for example. You know, something that, that I thought was interesting to kind of just circle back for a last minute to experience that we had in Africa was when, you know, after the climb, when the 17 of us got back together with the ground team, there was another 30 folks in Malawi at the time, right? Like uh, doing a service project that was absolutely amazing. And we all came together for this workshop with folks from all over the continent. But it was kind of what you were saying, like that opportunity, at least for me personally, to just listen a lot of the times at the table to hear about not only what was happening in some of the SACOs in Africa, but with the, the, the folks from the U.S. or from the U.K. or wherever people happen to be from in solving that, like kind of getting down to the members, like digging into an exercise and getting down to not just the person who's sitting on the board, not just the executive of the credit union, but that, that individual experience like you're talking about with the like affordable transportation. I, I thought that was something that came up over and over in that workshop that was for me, fascinating to listen and think through. I'd like to pivot a little bit here. I know a lot of folks that listen to the, the podcast or how do I put this up and comers in the credit union industry or maybe looking for that next opportunity beyond the DEI work. You, you've placed a lot of CEOs around the country here recently. You've been extremely busy and on the road. And I, I know you have a bunch of active searches going. This was a question that I guess I was looking forward to asking you that I know you and I have talked about again. And it's something that I've been asking other CEOs on the the podcast recently and and you you are a CEO you've been a CEO at a league you've you know a senior executive at credit union and all of that and, and yet you've placed a lot of senior leaders and CEOs what advice would you have for that person out there today who's maybe they're in a senior leadership position but they're looking for that shot that you know that that they want the shot of being a CEO today or in the near future let's just say is, is there a piece of advice that when you're working with a, a leader in the credit union system who wants that shot and maybe I'll take that even a step further. Maybe they're at a smaller credit union, with, but they want the bigger opportunity. Any advice that you have to, to give for the person out there who's looking for that that next CEO gig? <laughs> Lots of advice and, <laughs> um, and, and always deeply personalized to the individual in the situation. But to try to generalize it as a whole, if you think that you're ready to make that next step, to make that move, sort of the broad level advice I have is always be clear about where you're going to and not just what you're running from. So if you're bored in your current position and you think you want something different, and also I'll say it's flattering when the recruiter calls you and asks you to look at a job or, or think about a next one or somebody invites you into an application system. And sometimes that flattery, like our, our egos like it when somebody tells us, we should, we should apply for something. Um, or, you know, it, in the case of sort of this description of like, well, I'm ready for my next step and this one looks bigger or this title is, is at a higher level than what I have. And, and so, um, so people will sometimes jump into a search to a candidate pool. And what I think is super important is being really clear on what it is you want. Why do you want it? What matters? If you're going from a C-suite role to a CEO position, you are changing from having one boss to <laughs> seven or nine or 11 or 13. And, um, and that makes a huge difference. And if you go in and you interview with a hiring manager and the chemistry isn't there, you might say no thank you to that job. If you go in and interview with a board of directors and the chemistry isn't there, multiply that feeling of potential discomfort by like <laughs> nine, right? It's not. So if you wouldn't take a job with a hiring manager who makes you feel a certain way, but you go in and interview with the board and you think, well, I'll just fix it. It's more difficult to change a culture of nine. So, so going in with clarity, I think before you get swept into the excitement of the job search and the application process and, and going through and being chosen to advance to the next round, be clear on what kind of board CEO authority matrix you want? What kind of involvement you want from the board? What kind of communication style you want? Some boards are super hands off. Some boards are super hands on. Some boards are highly strategic. Some boards are a bit operational. And 
the individual in the CEO chair, while they'll have some influence over that, they need to make sure they're really comfortable with that communication. And 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 I think that would be true too. If you the other part of the question you asked, if you're moving from a smaller credit union to a larger credit union, similarly, like make sure it's an environment you want to be in, and not just ooh, that's an exciting asset size as you're moving forward with that. So crystal, crystal clear on what your non-negotiables are as you're looking for that search so that you can continue to interview your next prospective employer while you're going through that process. And it's not just about whether or not you get chosen for the next job. That's good stuff there. You know, we're getting closer to your end. Is there something that you think, you know, the leaders of our credit unions and organizations and maybe in general should be thinking about? And I guess I would, you know, take that from both the credit union perspective and just individually in their personal development? I think that we are continuing through a time of uncertainty right now. And I think it's difficult to predict some of the impacts that things will have. So we know, for example, I guess right now what's sort of breaking my heart in the moment is like the mortgage industry layoffs. And so we've seen a lot of people who may not be in our industry, but are close to our industry and some who are in our industry who are looking at unemployment right now. And for the last, what, 18 months or so, we all we've talked about is how it's a, it's a job seekers market. It's an employees market. And I have some real concerns that that's going to flip very fast and that employment certainty is going to, to change perhaps pretty quickly. And I think that creates a certain level of uncertainty. And then the other part to that too is, you know, when you look at, okay, well, the reason why we're having layoffs in the mortgage industry is because the mortgage environment is changing, lending environment is changing. So what's the potential impact on credit unions and their financial stability going forward with that? So I think there's a concern both from the perspective of economic well-being for credit unions, but economic well-being for consumers. Some recent studies have come out that actually say that consumer economic well-being is worse today than it has been before. And we knew it was bad before as far as savings rates and dollars available in emergencies. So I think that this general cognizance of what's really going on with, with consumer wallets at this point at a micro level is something that we need to be aware of and, and watching as an industry. I've got a question about workplace that I want to make sure that I get in. To me, and I don't know if this is just an assumption, but it feels like from a workplace perspective, we've like this year has kind of been more back to normal. I'm doing air quotes a little bit. Not really, you know, but like the idea of people are going to work, they're going back to conferences, there's business travels picked back up. I say all that and over the past two weeks, we've had COVID run through our house. So I mean, this is my first time talking to anybody in basically five days without a mask on. So, um, but that being said, I, so I know that, you know, I'm not saying that it's gone, but are you seeing any trends, I guess, now that we're where we are today on what it looks like, not only today, but going forward, if you care to make any predictions, like what does that career and credit unions look like? Yeah. So that's a great question. And I was recently speaking to a credit union. And the the tough thing about history is we don't know what it is until the books get written on it years (laughs) later. (laughs) So when we're living out a pivotal historic moment, we may be unclear about that in the moment. It just feels a little chaotic to us, but we aren't like, oh, wait, making history right here most times. And so what I had said to this organization was, I think back to when I got my master's degree in 2003-ish or so and had some HR classes in there, we spent time really digging into certain management theories that were outcomes of the assembly line of you know change management theory, like all of these things that somebody came in and said, whoa, something's happening in the workplace and we've got to change the way we're managing our people. And then... It's not in the moment that you say, all right, here's my theory X management style. Let's go with it. It gets named after it's used for a while. Right. I feel like we might be in a place like that right now. I feel like we might be in a place that years later we look back on and there's a name given to the management changes, the workplace environment that's happening right now. It's interesting you say that because when we were on the Serengeti, Mark Meyer and I were talking about that a little bit, about that transition from like open office Mm -hmm. and foosball tables and all of that to maybe we need a little space. And he mentioned, and I thought it was an interesting thing to think about, that idea that 
like people went from that complete open environment to needing a little bit of space in their productivity, maybe a door or a wall, to going home for two years and working where you had space. Mm -hmm. Like you didn't have a bunch of people around you. You know what I mean? To where we are today, what does that look like, right? Like it was that probably still an evolution. Like you're saying, maybe the book is still yet to be written, right? Right. Like, Yeah. And I think it's also from a difference too. If you talk to somebody who's maybe more seasoned in their career, they might say, well, this is just a blip. At the end of the day, the employer always controls the employees. This is the, this is the economy we have. These are the facts of it. And yeah, sure. You know, we, we've seen these swings before. What I think is different though is if you look at the demographics of the workplace right now, 50% of the workforce was born after 1981. So 50% oh, wow. of the workforce is millennial or, or younger. Yeah. And, We've known that there is a difference in the way, uh, frankly, there's a difference in the way these people were taught to think as they go through school. And so it changes the way you show up in the workplace where it's, you know, it wasn't reading, writing, arithmetic, memorize these facts for that generation. It was ask why, engage in critical thinking, look at things differently, figure out how to use technology as a tool. So we've really moved beyond, I think, I think maybe a generation ago, there was a fear of like, oh, are the robots going to take our job? <laughs> and this is not a, the workforce today is not concerned that the robots are going to take their jobs. They're looking at how do we use the technology better so that we can spend more time, you know, operating in. It's what, Gay Hendricks refers to as the jo- zone of genius in the big leap. It's what we use the Harrison assessment. We talk about it as enjoyment performance theory in that. But how do you find more time when you get to do the work that makes you feel like you're in the zone? And believe me, there are plenty of CEOs I talk to out there who are like, yeah, I don't care if this job lights you up or brings you joy, handle the transaction. <laughs> but we're going to have a, a workforce and, and hopefully some leaders too who are saying, we want people who are able to do what they do best every day. It's been a Gallup engagement question for decades. Um, We know people do better when they're operating in their strengths. And so what I'm curious about, and and I'm optimistic about it too, (laughs) is that we end up with a workforce where the individuals really are able to engage in work that is their highest contribution to the organization. But that's a major shift. And I think we're in a really painful point right now because what we are seeing instead is people who are like, this isn't fun. I'm, I quit. And so we're seeing that, that quiet quitting, that great resignation. And I'm hopeful that we'll get over that hill and get to a point where we're like, wow, it's a really incredible thing to have employees who are doing the work that lights them up every day. And we can figure out how to staff our organization to allow for this. Yeah. That that sounds nice. Uh, <laughs> who doesn't want to do it? Lights them up every day. That that sounds amazing. I'm kind of lucky I get to do that. Uh, <laughs> is there a question that before I'll put a couple of different things out there? Don't have a bunch of rapid fire questions for you this time around, just because of the fact that you've been on quite a bit, and I didn't have the bandwidth to make up a bunch of new ones. So you know, we're towards the end of the year. But is there anything that you were hoping that I would bring up today that you wanted to talk about, or you were hoping that I would ask you that I didn't? Yeah. So so one of the kind of questions that I was expecting, maybe or anticipating was really tied to like effectiveness of DEI programs and like what people are doing, what the trends in these are right now. And specifically, I want to talk about this area that I think is still overlooked and it's becoming more pronounced. So as we, as we've seen people, you know, again, kind of 2020, people are like, let's stand up some ERGs, let's stand up some DEI councils, let's get people who want to run DEI for our organization and put put some folks together and start doing that. And and people got excited and people started running with it. And now two years in, people are like, wait, what do we do? Like, we've already done cross-cultural potlucks and we've done, you know, we've sponsored the Pride Parade and we've done some listening sessions, but but what do we do to ensure that what we're doing from a DEI program perspective is part of what's advancing the organization strategically? And I think what gets often overlooked when people are starting DEI programs is assessment. And so people are looking around the world and saying, we've seen a best practice in other organizations being to do X, Y, Z, but they're not looking inside their organization and saying, what's really the state of the issues in our organization? What are our employees experiencing? 
What are our members experiencing or not experiencing that would create a, a more inclusive environment for them? And when organizations do those assessments, sometimes they find what they think were going to be their first steps are not really what their first steps should be. And so I'm a huge advocate for like, Take that time before you stand up your ERG, stand up your DEI council, sponsor your local events to actually pause and look inside the organization and say, what is the state of this today? And what do we need to address? And organizations sometimes find that, whoa, if we don't make sure that we first and foremost build capacity for inclusive leadership for anyone who has a direct report, Anything we say or do over in this area is going to feel like inauthentic lip service because we don't have the leaders who are ready for this. Or organizations may surprise themselves and find, wow, we're not really that diverse, but in fact, we're really inclusive. Like our our employee experience really is one of a high degree of psychological safety. And so we're building from a place where we have a practice already of making sure every employee has their voice heard. And now we can work on emphasizing diversity, knowing we're bringing people in to what is an inclusive organization already. This rabbit hole. Um, (laughs) So we're running late on time. But anyways, I have to ask a question. I'm being a digital media company analytics that measuring is just human nature, I guess. When you were talking there, I guess I was looking at the flip side of that as well. How do you measure your DEI efforts? Like, is that something that people are looking at? It's kind of that idea of like, if you don't have a goal, (laughs) you know what I mean? Um, Yeah, you probably regret asking this question due to the fact that we are short on time. This is a major, major topic of conversation right now. Might have to have you back. We've put together, (laughs) we at Humanity have put together a DEI success metrics task force, which um, brings together about a dozen leaders from some credit unions, their DEI practitioners in the credit union space to really dig into it and say, what should we be measuring? You know, we know what gets measured gets done. We know leaders, when they're held accountable for results, are more likely to achieve those results. So what do we look at? And the first, um, first major conversation we had around it was not just what should the success metrics be, but there was a pause and a conversation around how do we make sure that any success metric we set does no harm? Because we don't want to set success metrics that create tokenization or and and not authentic, impactful change. So um, that, that task force has been doing some great work. They've been looking at it pretty deeply. I know the NCUA has their diversity self-assessment that they're trying to use to get a benchmark, but they're wanting to get to a certain level of scale. So quick plug, uh, <laughs> if you're a credit union that hasn't done the NCUA's diversity self-assessment, do that so that we have some data to look at too from that perspective. But I think what we see is that when credit unions spend that time on assessment on the front end, it does help them set individual organizational benchmarks that then they can work to improve from on that. So that's as brief as I can be in the answer to that question for right now. <laughs> just means we'll have to do another one. So, I, uh, especially after the task force comes back. So I'm just going to wrap this up because we are 40 minutes in. So uh, uh, just a couple, a couple rapid fire questions. I'm going to skip over most of them that I was going to ask, but there, there's one that I always love asking you because you, I know you always have multiple books reading. So what are you currently reading? Is there something that you think everybody out there should be reading today? Yeah. So currently I'm reading The Color of Money. I love it for credit unions who believe that their role is to provide financial well-being for all. Because if you're not able to look and actually see what kind of inequities have systemically been advanced by traditional financial services, you may not know how to address those things. You know, there are a ton of books that I think everyone should read. (laughs) And something I've noticed about myself recently is that I have this quirk where if somebody asks me a question, I always answer the question with a book title, it feels like. So for example, if someone's like, oh, well, should I make a career change? I'm not like, well, tell me more. I'm like, you should read The Dip by Seth Godin. <laughs> and so, um, so, uh, Another book, you know, so in the interest Godin. of there time, go. instead of yeah. going through all of these, if, if somebody has a question that they'd like me to respond with a book title, they can email me and I'll, I'll do that. But. <laughs> we will link to all, to all your, your connection points there in the, uh, in the show notes. Okay, I did have to ask you this one. This came up when we were at the African American Credit Union Coalition Conference and having dinner with our friend... NCOA chairman Harper. And the question he wanted, uh, he thought would be perfect was, who plays you in the movie biopic of your life? (laughs) So I'm so glad that you had time to ask me this question because after I saw the preliminary questions, this is the one that frankly, I uh, spent the most time considering. (laughs) (laughs) Took this question real seriously. And what I settled on is 
if things go my way, I'm choosing Anna Kendrick. And two reasons. For one thing, her depiction of her character in the movie Up in the Air, particularly when she's on the plane working and George Clooney looks over at her and she's like, I type with purpose. I'm like, <laughs> that, I relate purpose. to that. <laughs> but then also like... She has the range to also play Poppy from Trolls. And I'm feeling like I would need somebody who could both like address that intensity that I often bring and also the woohoo style of that that comes from that. So Anna Kendrick is my answer. I love it. (laughs) That is awesome. Well, I I appreciate you again taking the time to be here today. We will link to everything we talked about in the show notes. Before we go, anything you'd like to add or an ask of our listeners today? I guess maybe... I would just say, and it's probably advice that I've given before, but you have to hear something seven times in order for it to resonate, right? So be intentional, be aware of the impact that that your actions have, and be intentional about making those a, a positive impact with it. Awesome. Perfect way to wrap this up. A few things before we go. Make sure to check out Elon credit cards in the show notes. They're digital technology, industry leading rewards products and commitment to the credit unions makes them a great partner for the show. And I'm so grateful for their support to have this much fun doing what I do. Please also subscribe to the CU Insight Experience podcast on your favorite podcast player, Apple. We're on them all. If you're looking for a book mentioned like the ones Joe mentioned today, a quick Google of the CU Insight Experience podcast book list and your next read is on its way from Amazon or downloaded on Audible. So last but certainly not least, I want to thank all of you for listening. Y'all rock and I appreciate all the kind words that that come in about the show. Be well, friends. See you all soon.